Good morning, y'all. I'm Jinx Farmer, and we're in the shady part of our garden today. Shady part of our crinum field. I'm going to explain why in a minute. Today, we're going to talk about purple leafed plants. Purple, burgundy, black, all of those colors get used to refer to various shades of plants. Um, we are here to talk about purple leaf plants and gardening and garden design and color theory. We're going to talk about purple leaf plants and what else? Some kind of geeky terms. We'll have a little biology lesson in the middle. My friend, speaking of geeky terms, my friend Linda Lee is a professional botanist and she's going to explain um, some of the science of it, but also she's going to talk about dyeing with purple leaf plants and coloring fabrics. And that we're um, going to end up with a, a look at, um, oh, let's see, it's going to be Father's Day next week. So we're going to look at our Father's Day special that we have for you all that has a very tenuous connection to purple leaf plants. And the big finale, we're going to look at shisho tea, which is kind of um, kind of purple. It's more like a rusty sweet tea color, but there's a trick to making the chemicals in purple leaves. Sweetie pie, you're looking the wrong way. We're going to make our purple leaf tea turn bright pink. So let's get started. We all, you know, we also have our purple martins in the background just to keep the purple theme going. Um, and back in, come up. Let's look real close here. Um, when I when I get close to Linda, we're going to use our mask, but generally we're going to um, stay apart. Um, Sweet pie. <laughs> when I was back in Seattle in the 90s which was kind of the heyday of like really high high toned artsy perennial gardening it's when people were doing lots and lots of um color gardens right there were people doing hot gardens and white gardens and pastel gardens so i learned a lot or i refused to learn a lot i guess because i thought some of it was really silly about color design um, my friend Jim Martin was really into it. My friend Charlie is an awesome colorist. And Ruth Knopp, who was down at Boone Hall, did amazing color gardens. But I think um, one of the things that Ruth taught me was that in interior design and in all color theory, there are colors that like bridge other colors. They're sort of transition or blender colors. Sweet pie, if you pull my mic off, She's getting ready to. Um, one traditionally in gardens, you think about silvers and grays as those blender colors, but in hot climates, purples can actually do the same thing or burgundy. So look at this flower arrangement. Okay, you got it, Tom. Lots of people would say this is bad color combinations right there they should be all strongs we should have strong orange we have weird colors in here but what um what people do to help quell the the bad taste i guess is use something that mutes the colors and helps transition one color from the next like these weird pinks transition a little bit better to the real bright yellows and purples if you have this burgundy foliage in there. All right, is, does anybody see that? Do you see that, Linda? I do. You do? Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I just think no matter what, that's a pretty arrangement, even if it's weird colors. It is. All right, but so. I think, I think that have the contrast brings it out. It does, and contrast is a big part of what we use purples for in garden design. like. People love this combination. These chartreuse yellows mixed with deep purple. Look at that. You're right, Portia. It's a lovely color palette. Jewels of Opar mixed with Crinum Mini Hune. Edible, by the way. Come Jewels on. of Opar? Yes. I know, but it's like slimy. It's like eating a slug. I didn't say it was good. Well. All right, here's another one, gold liriope mixed in. Buck, the animals are just in the way today, aren't they? 
Here's another one that I think looks great. Crinum mini hune mixed with gold leaf liriope. So y'all know part of why we do this is to um, generate a few little sales. So I've got to promote this plant right now. Crinum mini hune, our shortest crinum. In full sun, this is a little lesson to do with purple. In full sun, this plant is stubby and almost black. I'll see how dark it is, right? If you put it in um, a little bit of shade, the color looks different. If I move it around, the color looks different. If I got it in some sun, the color looks different. But between growing in sun and shade, there's actually a physical difference in how these colors react and how, they, um, how strong they are. So inside the leaf, there's this difference that Linda might jump in and explain, but I'm going to show you um, an example here. This plant is called amaranth. This one is Hopi red dye is the cultivar. If you notice the two different plants, this one just came up in the shade. This one I pulled up from the sun. So I don't know if y'all can... Um, see. That's the shade. No, this is sun where we have more of the purples. So what happens is these purple anthocyanins actually act like sunscreen. That's real simplified, but they help protect this plant. So the one from the sun is darker and more purple and shorter than the one that gets shade. So if I put those two together, I hope that y'all can see that on the camera. So same thing happens with that crinum mini hune. In the sun, it's short and stubby and black, and in the shade, it'll grow to about 18 inches and be a little bit more green. So why is that, Linda? So you mentioned anthocyanin, um, and that's actually the compound that creates that reddish purplish color, but it takes energy to produce all these compounds. And so that's one reason why you, that's one, that's one reason why you would potentially have the plant being smaller because energy that would be put towards growth is being put towards making these compounds. Now obviously if a plant is investing in this way there must be some reason, right? So like Jinx said um, they do protect the plant from uh, UV radiation. They also, uh, plants obviously need sun to produce food but there's a limit to how fast they can photosynthesize and so if they're just being bombarded by too much light energy then that can also be damaging to the plant and so these compounds help absorb some of those energies uh, they also are uh, they can scavenge free radicals and so that's one reason why they're sort of become a health craze to consume a lot of dark purple fruits and things like that the hope is that they'll scavenge some of the free radicals inside our own bodies and, and help reduce our own oxidative stress. So we know that they scavenge free radicals. We know that happens in the plant, right? but we don't know if it happens in us. I, I'm not up on that science, so yeah. I'm just not going to comment okay. on that. Okay. Um, I don't study animals. So <laughs> what? But, but you have to study animal reactions with the plants, right? So does that purple do anything else? It has... Because I would think if I was an animal going around, I would be like, oh, I want to go see that purple plant, right? Well, so studies have shown, well, first of all, many non-mammalian animals don't actually see these colors very well. Uh, reds and things like that. That's one of the reasons why if you're doing uh, sea turtle studies, you wear, uh, you put a, a red filter over your flashlight. They don't see that light very well. Anyway, um, but, but yeah, so there have been studies that have shown that uh, some insects prefer the yellow and green uh, maple leaves as opposed to red, but I don't know that they have actually figured out what the reason is, whether it's palatability or digestibility or just what it is. And that's um, aphids actually prefer the orange, yellow, and chartreuse Japanese maples to the maples. And you're referring to a scientific study that I posted in the group. So if anybody wants to look at it, it's an awesome study. Um, it goes into all of this, but it's also awesome because it's so well written. Like it's just. I believe the title is Anthocyanins, the Swiss Army Knives of the Plant World, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, it's excellent. Um, 
So another thing that he talked about, I, I, was it a he? Anyway, the author, I, it, I believe it was the yeah, author yes. of Swiss Army Knives talked about was how um, this certain plant in California produces toxins in its leaves that inhibit predation by insects. But the problem with this is that toxin actually breaks down in the sun and in the green chlorophyll of leaves. So in order to protect itself, it makes these little spots on the leaves. Tom, so um, this is not the plant he's talking about, but I've always wondered like, why? What is this, what is this doing? It could be, um, like Linda said, it could be a defense from an um, animal. It could be a defense from an herbivore. Maybe, maybe herbivores don't like to eat spotted leaves. But in that case, these spots are acting like tiny little umbrellas. So in those spots, that toxin produced in the leaf is actually really concentrated. Um, this is Drymiopsis. This is, again, it's not the plant I'm talking about. He's talking about in the article, but um, I gotta sell a little bit here. This is the QVC moment, y'all. Um, it's called African Hosta. I don't know if it's African. I know it's not a hosta, which is probably, you know, the names, the names of these plants are just crazy. I like the name leopard lily. Obviously, it's not a leopard either, but um, it has this really pretty spotted leaf. It's a great little dense ground cover for deep shade. Stop it. <laughs> and, and the cool thing about leopard lily is that when we sell them in little pots like this, um, but it makes a great container plant. It's incredibly drought. And when you get one, look, you're actually getting a whole bunch of stuff and you can just divide them up like that and stick them in the ground. So one little pot will cover an area like 10 inches square. Okay, where are we in our presentation? What are you looking at? Bach, Bach is getting a little butt rub. Likes a butt rub. You are bending my fence, Buck. Hey, you know what? Well, okay, so we're going to separate now. I got to take this mask off. Um, but before we go, Linda's going to talk a little bit about dyeing. Before we do, if you can look over here, Tom, and show us our um, amorphophallus. This is the leaf of a morphophallus. This is one leaf, okay? This is the stem of the leaf. So this is the one leaf coming up. And then behind it is the flower. And Isn't that cool? And that's gonna smell beautiful, right? So, yeah, well, no, those smell like rotting meat. Yeah, but you can see why it's called anything phallic, right? And then it sets all of, these are the, um, the female parts. It's gonna set all these like red berries down there. Hey, Bob Waits. And what else? While we're in the shady area, um, you see we do grow some crinums in the shade. People ask me that all the time. But I want to point out, if you look up, you see that this gets some sun. So this gets about four hours of direct sun a day. Um, one of our new crinums, this is called Kim Marine from a great breeder. This is called Kim Marine, great breeder in North Carolina, Jay York. Okay, so I'm going to hand the mic off to Linda, and while we walk, she's going to talk a little bit about dyeing. So anthocyanins are not the only beautiful red purple compound out there. Um, this is a jar of pickle beets. Gloria and I grew beets this year. Actually got a good crop. And this is a compound uh, called betalin. Um, that it performs a lot of similar functions to anthocyanins, but but it's slightly different. Um, and it's only found in certain plant groups, unlike anthocyanins, which are really widespread. And it's also the same compound in pokeweed berries. I don't know if you're familiar with those, but they were actually used as an ink at one time. Um, but it's not a very permanent ink. And that's the thing. There's so many beautiful colors like this that just all around us, the amaranth, the beets, everything. But most of them are not permanent. If you want to dye something, you want it to stay that color, right? And so that's kind of the problem is finding things that, that will actually be permanent. 
Uh, in fact, most of the purple colors, there's one that was actually derived from a snail back in, in the Mediterranean in ancient times, but they would often cut that with a cheaper dye that still fairly expensive, I think, that was derived from lichens. And those were fermented with ammonia. It's orchil dye. When you, when you say um, they don't last, what are you talking about? If you were to dye something with, say, pokeberry juice, mm -hmm. and you dyed your white t-shirt, and suddenly it's beautiful, beet colored, mm -hmm. would it be a year? Or I guess it we're, depends on how much you wash it, or is there anything you can do to make that last longer? If you keep it in a closet, it'll last <laughs> longer. But I actually, ha I thought about bringing a bottle of pokeberry ink that I made two years ago. But even though it just sat in a cabinet, it still has lost most of its color or a lot of its oh, color. Wow. But yeah, I mean, if I dyed a shirt with, with beet juice or, or pokeweed, and I left it out in, in the sun for a month, I would probably expect it to be straw colored by the end of that. I don't know, I haven't tried, but that's that's a ballpark. But you do guess. a lot of dyeing. You 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 can um there are other chemicals you can mix to like bind colors to fabric, right? That's true. Those are called mordants. They're sort of the glue that helps um that helps the the dye molecules actually absorb into the fabric and stay there. Some dyes don't need mordants. Some do. And you prefer not to use mordants. I prefer it. Um, it's um, some of them are kind of toxic. Some of them are not that bad. But I also just really enjoy the kind of purity of going straight from plant to color. And because I am a botanist, I'm not a chemist. Right. You know, I want to teach people about plants. Uh, chemistry is great. Um, had studied it since high school. Hey, can I um can I take that now? Because I just yeah. remembered something that um I hadn't thought about when we were talking about the amaranth, but. I got this amaranth from A.L. Hudson, who was out in California, and he did a lot of work with um, Native Native um, American people from Mexico, what's now Mexico and Central America, and and also with um, Southwestern Americans. This one's name is Hopi Red Dye. And he would name plants like that so it would indicate what they were used for. So you should try that. Well, we got a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, we, you know, before we leave Linda, we should do, I wonder if Chelsea's on. We should do a, a whole program on dyeing. I think um, the idea of gardening to dye. Gardening to dye. I have to get a t-shirt for that. Dye garden <laughs> sounds a little better. You think gardening to die would be um, a, a nice uh, longer presentation and we might be able to do that in conjunction with Red, Red Cliff or some museum. Could be. And you could do it. Yeah. Some of the best dyes come from, from fungi actually, so we might do some of that too. What's the word that starts with the M? Mordants? Mordants. Mordants. Um, thank you, Linda. So. Um, Y'all, we're going to kind of wrap up a little bit, but I have three things I want to talk about. Um, one is that it is Father's Day, um, so we're shipping this week. We have to have orders really by Monday in order to ship gifts. So if you know a man that you want to get into gardening, a man that needs connection, um, only today and really only for y'all if you want to send a gift we're going to substitute into our 28 dollars gift pack i think there's a link up there if not um you just go to the website and look for that pack these bradley's which are big old fat bulbs and have burgundy flowers and our gift pack looks something like this right it's just the crinums you get this uh, this little awesome booklet we get a note and a sweet picture of me and Tom. I mean, every guy wants that, right? All right, there's a the sale pitch. Um, finally, we're going to try this, this thing with tea. I've got to have a white background to do this. All right, so this tea is um, made from shisho or southerners call it parella actually i'm gonna i'm gonna pour some of that out but y'all see it's um it's tea colored right a little is that purple 
I don't know. It, to me, it's like brown tea colored. But that's the anthocyanin that's causing this. Um, in regular tea, sweet tea, it's actually a different chemical that colors it. But in this case, the anthocyanins are coming from the plant. The plant has a purple leaf. There's a lot of, um, or a little bit of interest anyway, in using these as pH indicators. So it, I started out by saying the purples can look different in different environments. It can be sunshine, but it can also be soil. So if it's growing in a high pH environment, um, it has a different coloration. So this she show is actually going to change and indicate a pH change when I empty some lime juice into it. So as it solidifies, no, I'm sorry, as it acidifies, did it change, Tom? Yes. Sir. Huh? Can y'all see that? Oh, that's pink. Okay, so if you see, wouldn't that be fun? I think we have some um, some guys watching, some young some youngsters watching. I think that's a good science lesson. And if we have some adults watching, if you put a little a little tequila and ice in that, it would be a perfect brunch trick, bartender trick, y'all. Um. Thank you very much. Next week, we're going to try to do this a little more interactive. I know that y'all have questions, and we don't have a way right now to answer those questions. So we're going to try to do something so that we can make it a little bit more interactive. Um, thank you very much, and check out our website. Check out our farm in the background.